Proudly, we hail. From New York City, where the American stage begins, here is another program with a cast of outstanding players. Public service time has been made available by this station to bring you this story, as proudly we hail the United States Army. Our story is entitled, Portrait with a Future. This is one of those stories that certainly proves it's a small world. When an American GI on duty in England sees a portrait that looks a great deal like himself and, well, that would give the story away. Our first act curtain will rise in just a moment, but first, young man, here's news about an important opportunity for you. Right now, the United States Army, the senior service of our armed forces, has an urgent need for qualified technicians to operate and service the complex equipment that science has brought into being. The need is vital, and you can be trained in such interesting career fields as radio, electronics, radar, photography, meteorology, mechanics, and many, many others. Yes, indeed. Here's your chance to acquire a skill that will be of value to your country and help you later in civilian life, too. For full details, visit the recruiting sergeant at your nearest recruiting station today. And now your Army presents the proudly we hail production, Portrait with a Future. A lonely boy and a lonely old man, one American, the other British. These are the two most important characters in our play. Without the United States Army, they would never have met. And without Chaplain Gerald Wilkes, they would never have followed this meeting to its natural conclusion. Excuse me, Chaplain. Of course, Corporal. Come in. Um, may I speak to you for a few minutes, sir? My door is always open. What's your name? Uh, Anderson, sir. Corporal Richard Green Anderson. Well, close the door, Corporal, and make yourself comfortable. Thank you, sir. Relax, son. You look about as wound up as a watch spring. I guess I am, Chaplain. Something, something happened to me yesterday that's got me tied up in knots. Do you want to tell me about it? Well, that's why I'm here, sir, but... Now that I am, it isn't as easy as I thought it was going to be. How about a cup of coffee? It's my one vice. I keep a hot plate here in the office. Coffee would be wonderful. Sugar? Cream? A little of both, please, sir. You're very polite. Your parents have brought you up very well. <laughs> wasn't my parents, sir. They're both dead. I... I was brought up in an orphanage. No relations at all? No, sir. Here's your coffee, son. Oh, thank you, sir. Now, do you think you can tell me whatever it is that's bothering you? I'll try, but it may sound a little peculiar. Well, that's possible, but I doubt it. Over the years, I've found that very few people's problems are peculiar or funny. If a problem is on someone's mind, it's a serious one. Yes, sir. Then go on. I'm not going to laugh at you. Well, sir, you see, I've never had a family. My parents died when I was seven. Since they had no relatives, I was placed in an orphanage. Any brothers or sisters? No, sir. I see. Uh, excuse my interruption. Well, the orphanage wasn't so bad, you see. There were lots of other kids around. I was never alone. But when I finished training school there, they got me a job and told me I was on my own. What kind of a job did they get you? Well, I was trained to be a mechanic, sir. I 
Seem to have a knack with motors. They, they, they got me a good job in a garage. And then you were on your own. That's right, sir. And that's when my trouble started. You see, all of a sudden, I was alone. During the day, there were plenty of people around and everything was fine. But at night, when I went to my room, I was alone for the first time in my life. It was then that I realized that I was alone in the world, that I had no one to love and no one who loved me. Yeah, that sounds silly, doesn't it? No, son, it doesn't sound silly. After a couple of months, I couldn't stand it. Got so I never went home at all, just to all night movies. I knew I was going to be drafted soon, so I thought, why not enlist now? You'll make friends in the army, you'll belong to something. So that's what I did. Sounds like a smart idea. Yeah, it worked out, too. The army's all right as far as I'm concerned, but... But what? I'm, I'm still different from most of the other guys. They have roots outside of the army. They get letters and packages from home. They write home to family, to their girls. The army's only a part of their lives. It's all of mine. I'm happier in the army than I've ever been in my life, but I still feel lonely at times. Didn't you have a girl back home? Not really, sir. I... Met a few girls after I got out of the orphanage. I had a couple of dates, but I was only out a couple of months before I enlisted. What about the orphanage? Couldn't you write to them? <laughs> sure, but... Well, what's the use of kidding myself? I'm just one out of thousands. They can't be family to everyone. Besides, it's a funny thing. Once you're away from something for a while, you seem to lose your ties. Except when it comes to your family. And you can't adjust to the fact that you don't have one, is that it? Why... Well, I think I have adjusted as much as I can. But you can't stop your mind from thinking. You can't force your heart to stop dreaming. No, I don't think you can. So you feel alone? Yes, sir. Except for Sally. I, I, I just don't have any roots. Sally? You haven't mentioned her before. No, I guess I haven't. It's funny, too, because she means so much to me. Is she an English girl you met over here? No, sir. She's a member of the wax station here. And are you two very close? Well, we're planning on being married in two months, sir. I see. Congratulations. Thank you, sir. But still a but? Yeah, I'm afraid so, sir. You see, last weekend we both had a pass and decided to go sightseeing around here. On Sunday after church, we, we went to visit Greenlee Hall. Uh, that big manor house up the road about ten miles. The Duke of Greenlee has thrown the house open to tourists at 50 cents a head. And we were taking a tour, walking around. This was the main banquet room in the days when knights were bold. Gosh, Dick, I can hear the armor clanking, can't you? The corridor on your right is lined with family portraits. Uh, not very good ones at that. We'll pass over them for now and go on to the study. I don't want to pass over them. Neither do I. Let's hang back and lose the tour so we can look at them. Okay. That guide's been pretty much of a bore anyhow. The oak paneling you see in the study was added to the house in the 16th century. At that time, it was thought that all studies should be dimly lit and have a very serious mean. They're gone. Come on. I want to see those second-rate ancestors. Oh, now, there's a real ugly one. I wonder who she was. Mm, it tells on this little plaque. It's Amelia, 5th Duchess of Greenleaf. Oh, 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 look at this one. Is he a monster? Well, he's not exactly a monster, but he certainly isn't handsome. Would you marry me if I looked like him? Not even if you were a duke. Oh, I love you, Sally. I'm very lucky that you love me, too. Oh, no. I'm the lucky one because I found you and trapped you. <clears throat> I, uh, I beg your oh. pardon. I, oh, what? I, I, I didn't mean to, uh, to but, but I was... Uh, <clears throat> that is, I... Uh, well, it's our fault, I, we just couldn't help it. You see, we're in love, and we're going to be married in two months, and... Oh, please don't apologize. I should know better than to walk around in felt slippers on visitor's day. You're not the first young couple that's stolen a kiss in the halls of Greenlee. Well, I'm afraid it isn't very proper, though. I don't know. Perhaps it'll warm the place up a bit. I... It's always confounded cold in here. Oh, I don't think we noticed. Just think of all the history that was made in this drafty corridor. True, but history never took the place of central heating. 
But uh, I must go. I excuse me. Uh, you don't think the Duke would mind our looking at these pictures, do you? I'm positive he wouldn't. The only thing that puzzles him is why people bother. <clears throat> well, cheerio. Uh, goodbye, sir. Would you think we ought to leave now? Oh, let's look at the rest of the pictures first. All right. Hey, don't go so fast. Hey, it's for horses. Oh, Dick. Dick, come here. What's the matter, honey? Look. At what? At the face in this picture. What? Good Lord, it does. It's weird. Without that little beard, the man in the picture and you could be twins. Alfred, second son of the eighth Duke of Greenlee. Oh, it's just a coincidence. Maybe. But that man we met in here before. Why, in this half light, I thought you looked a little like him. Of course, he was older. Sally, you're imagining. I could be, but your mother's maiden name was Green. Greenlee. Why, they're almost the same. It would be like a dream come true, but it's impossible. Why impossible? Your mother once told you her ancestors were English. Oh, Dick, you've wanted a family, root the home for so long. Why don't you try and find out? I'd give my right arm if it were true. Well, then ask, darling. Talk to someone. See someone. I couldn't face it. I'm afraid. Afraid of what? What couldn't you face? One simple word. No. No. Monday, Chaplin. I haven't been able to sleep. I've hardly eaten. I just think about it. It races through my mind over and over again. A family, a home, a place to sink your roots. But, son, how can I be of assistance? Help me, Chaplin. Sunday, I started out for the place ten times, and ten times I stopped and came back. Would it help if I spoke to the Duke? Would you, sir? If you could just take the first little step for me, I'll tell you everything about myself, my parents, everything. But I, I just can't get myself to go and ask. Go outside for a few minutes and wait, son. I'll make a call. If His Grace the Duke will see me, I'll want every fact you have about your mother. I'll have to know where you were born, exactly what you remember her telling you about her mother and father, everything. Oh, I'll do what I can, sir. Dear father, thy will be done. Operator, I'd like to make an outside call, but I don't know the number. Chaplain Wilkes, yes. Oh, uh, Greenlee Hall. It's about ten miles north of the camp. I don't know what town. Yes, you can call me back. You are listening to the Proudly We Hail production of Portrait with a Future. We'll return to our story in just a moment. Young man, if you're interested in continuing your education, here's important news for you. The senior service of our armed forces, your United States Army, urgently needs qualified technicians to operate and maintain the many kinds of equipment that science has brought into being. And right now, men are being trained in wonderful fields like radio, radar, meteorology, mechanics, photography, and others. And this training is given by the finest technical training schools in the world. Yes, here's an excellent opportunity for you young men with intelligence and ambition. Your opportunity to start a career for yourself, not only for now, but for when you get back into civilian life. For full details, visit your nearest recruiting office today. You are listening to Proudly We Hail, and now we present the second act of Portrait with a Future.
Most of us are blessed with a family and friends, so perhaps we never realize how alone we would be without them. Even Chaplain Wilkes cannot feel the deep loneliness of Corporal Richard Green Anderson. But in his capacity as chaplain, because someone has come to him for help, he's doing all he can, and then a little more. You wanted to see me, Chaplain? Private Robertson? Yes, sir. Please come in and sit down. I wanted to talk to you about Corporal Anderson. I understand you two are planning on being married and... Well, there's nothing wrong, is there? He's not in any trouble, if that's what you mean. But yesterday he came in to see me on a personal problem of which I think you are aware and asked for my help. Now, before I can help him, I need to find out more about him. And from what he told me, you probably know more about him than anyone else in the world. Well, he has confided in me, if that's what you mean. He asked me to break in on someone's life, to ask very personal questions and possibly revive family skeletons. I don't mind doing it if he's really sincere, if his need is great enough. Do you understand? Yes, Chaplain, I do. And his need is very great. I, I noticed him first at the service club. He'd sit with a group of fellows, and then one of them would say he had to write a letter. One by one, they'd all drift away to write to their families and their girls. He'd just sit there with his face tight and drawn. After I got to know him, I, I found out that there are only two words that he's never heard in all his life. Two words that he wants to hear more than life itself. And they are, welcome home. I see. Oh, I keep telling him that after we're married, my family will be his family. And he says it's not the same thing. Well, he's right, I suppose. But they'll love him. Gee, I don't see how anyone can help loving him. He'll need their love, too. Now, there's just one more thing. Saturday, when you were at Greenlee Hall, did you really notice the resemblance between Dick and the picture first? Or did he notice it and talk you into it? Well, what did Dick say? What do you say? I noticed it first, Chaplain, and I called him over. He wasn't even near it at the time, and that's the truth. I believe it is, Sally. Do you believe this is possible? Yes, I do. <laughs> then I say to myself, maybe it's because I want it to be true. I think Dick's a very lucky boy. Thank you, Chaplain. But I think I'm the lucky one. Are you seeing him tonight? Of course. I have an appointment to see His Grace, the Duke, tomorrow. I don't know whether to tell Dick about it or not. Dick knows I called him, so perhaps you had better tell him. In any case, ask Dick to come to see me tomorrow afternoon. Oh, I will, Chaplain. And thank you. And Sally, tell Dick that I'm hoping it's true, just as much as you both are. <laughs> Yes, sir. I'm Chaplain Wilkes. I have a 10 o'clock appointment with His Grace. Oh, yes, sir. Come right this way, please. Chaplain Wilkes. Ah, oh, Chaplain Wilkes, so kind of you to come. That'll be all, Clive. Uh, yes, Your Grace. Do let's sit close to the fire, Chaplain. This house is blasted cold this time of year. Thank you. That's the reason I allow these confounded tours. With the extra money, I'm going to put in central heating. Uh, that's one thing you Americans have that we English need badly. <laughs> On the other hand, we might learn something from you about how to build houses that last a thousand years. What? Oh, quite, yes, quite. <clears throat> now, Chaplain, as to the reason for your visit, you can imagine that... Your news came as quite a shock. I admit it all sounds like a plot from a movie, but young Anderson and I think it may just possibly be true. Well, I'm an old man, Chaplain, and quite alone in the world. I'm the last of the Greenleys. I must admit to you that if this young man is as fine as you say he is, I'd, I'd like it to be true myself. That's good to hear, Your Grace. There's still a bit of money in this house. Should an heir appear, however, I want to be sure that he really is related. He'll come into it all someday. I understand. All my family is dead. Almost all my friends are gone. I sit in this old house day after day with no one but Clive and the cook. I, I must admit it would be nice to have a young person around the house 
Well, now, uh, down to cases, sir. Just what can we do? I mean, where can we make inquiries and all that sort of thing? Well, Your Grace, I've started already. I've asked the Red Cross to check with the orphanage where the young man was brought up. And then they're checking on his mother, through whom the two of you would be related, if you were at all. The mother? Uh, yes. yes. You see, her maiden name was Green. Green. Incidentally, which portrait was it that the boy resembled so strikingly? The one of Alfred, second son of the eighth Duke of Greenlee. Really? My Uncle Alfred? Yes. How strange and... And yet, how possible? Why does that make it so possible, Your Grace? Because in his youth, Alfred and his father fought constantly. And once, after a particularly bitter quarrel, Alfred left the house and never came back. The family received just one note from him after that, saying that he'd gone to America and that they'd never hear from him again. And did they? Never. When Alfred's older brother died, childless, and he was in line to become the ninth duke... They began a search for him in America, but to no avail. It was, it was then that my father inherited the title. I see. I wonder why they never located him. Well, one reason that occurred to them then and seems even more possible now is that he changed his name. Of course, from Greenlee to Green. Exactly. If this young man of yours is related to me, he must be Alfred's grandson. Amazing. Not only a family, but a title, oh, too. Now, just a minute, Chaplain. Let's not count our foxes before they're caught. This is still supposition. We have no proof as yet, and proof is what we need. Now, you're doing all you can on your end. If you'll give me all the facts at your command, I'll start on this end. It should only take a few days at most to check birth certificates and all that, but... We must be sure. I'll tell you everything I know, Your Grace. Good. Then let's get to it. Believe it or not, Chaplain, I, I'm as anxious as you are to find out that it's true. And that's what happened yesterday, Sally. They're checking. All we can do is sit it out. On pins and needles, you might add. On oh, worse than that. Oh, Sally, I've been praying every minute. All night long, I lie in my bed and I can think of just one thing. And then I say to myself, just a day or two more, maybe, and the suspense will all be over. Dick, what will you do if it isn't true? Isn't true? But it must be. It's got to be. No, it doesn't. Your mother could have been just plain Miss Green, with no relation at all to the Greenleys. You're right. But I don't know what I'd do. Well, you've, you've, you've got to promise me something. What? If it isn't true, you've got to go on. Never lose hope. But most of all, please go on loving me. I'll always love you, Sally. No matter what. Is that a promise? Oh, with all my heart, I promise. Well, Chaplain, as you Americans say, I'm as jumpy as popcorn over a fire. Well, I'm not exactly calm myself, Your Grace. Still no word, eh? I'm expecting the final information any hour now. Yes, good. You know, I've, I've been thinking how wonderful it would be for me, if it is true, to have, to have that young man here. I, there'll be young footsteps in the house again. Perhaps even children running up and down these corridors. I wouldn't count on that, Your Grace. Why not? He likes the army. He's planning to make it his career. Yes, I, I see. Then I'll still be alone after all. No, you won't, Your Grace. Not really. Remember those little miracles that men have made that we were talking about a few moments ago? Oh, you mean the telephone and the wireless? Yes, those two, but mainly the airplane. They'll come to see you every year, and I'm sure you're not too old to get on a plane yourself to visit them. Too old for flying? Of course I'm not. Well, then? Well, you're right. Perhaps having all that youth around all the time might be too much for a grumpy old man like me. Uh, excuse me, Your Grace, but there's a telephone call for Chaplain Wilkes. Oh, well, thank you, Clive. <clears throat> this must be the answer we've been waiting for, Chaplain. I imagine it is. Do you, uh, you wish us luck, Chaplain? More than that, Your Grace. I'm praying for you both.
Yes, sir. Uh, uh, I'm Corporal Richard Green Anderson. I, I have an appointment with his, with his grace, the Duke. Oh, yes, Corporal Anderson, you're expected. Uh, will you follow me, please? Corporal Richard Green Anderson of the United States Army, Your Grace. Uh, thank you, Clive. Uh, that'll be all. Yes, Your Grace. I... <clears throat> I don't think I'm going to be very good at this after all, Corporal. I... I had a little speech plan, but I... I, I... I... I don't know what to say myself, Your Grace. Your Grace? I'm not Your Grace to you, my boy. Our investigation has proved beyond a shadow of a doubt that you are the grandson of the man who should have been the ninth Duke of Greenlee, my Uncle Alfred, the man whose portrait you resemble so closely. No, indeed, not your grace, sir. I'm your cousin Charles. Yes, your grace. I, I mean, cousin Charles. Uh, cousin Richard, out of all the things that I was going to say, I can remember only this and... I say it from the bottom of my heart. Cousin Richard, welcome home. U.S. Army needs men, men who take a special pride in being part of a man's army. If you're a high school graduate, you can join now, and after basic training, apply for assignment to any Army school for the finest technical training. Now, if you qualify for the school you select and come within the quota, you'll be assigned to it, but however you choose to serve. It's service that means a special pride, the sense of a job well done in a man's army. Young men between the ages of 18 and 34, men who look to the future, are now choosing the United States Army. Visit your nearest recruiting station today and grow with the world's greatest army and the opportunities it offers you. This has been another program on Proudly We Hail, presented transcribed in cooperation with this station. Proudly We Hail is produced by the Recruiting Publicity Center for the United States Army Recruiting Service. This is Mark Hamilton speaking, inviting you to tune in this station next week for another interesting story on Proudly We Hail.